Good afternoon, everybody, or good morning, depending on what time zone you're in. I want to thank you, and I want to apologize for my virtual appearance. I've just received, uh, after a fair bit of trying, permanent residency in Australia, and now I have to clock up the 24 months in country that I need to receive an Australian citizenship. So I'm trying to limit my travel internationally over the next years until I can actually get it. So, without further ado, today's talk is called Hypercasting. Part 1, The Story So Far. Everything is changing. Everything has changed. Everything always changes. But at times, this change is particularly pronounced and thus specifically noteworthy. For media, which is the topic du jour, this is so plainly obvious that any attempt to refer to a before time has an almost archaeological feel, as though we were shoveling carefully through layers of dirt to find out how media worked just a few years ago. These transformations have been seismic and singular. There's no going back. But what exactly has happened? The revolution we glimpsed in 1994, when that rough beast of the web, its hour come at last, made the earth tremble, seducing and subsuming us into its ever-broadening expanse, that fell back for a while into patterns more established and more familiar. We glimpsed a utopia, then a fog rose and the vision faded. We endured half a decade of cupidity, stupidity, and the slow strangulation of our dreams. We longed for communion. We got DVD players delivered in under an hour. Fortunately, the network accelerates everything it embraces, and what might have taken just a an entire generation just a few years ago took five years to run its course from Netscape to Razorfish and the lunar crater of Nasdaq seemed to spell the final doom of all our hopes the web people loudly proclaimed was so over silly humans during those first five years we learned just how different net network economics could be not just in theory but in practice we learned that the essence of the digital artifact is that it exists to be copied. Like a gene in the Cambrian seas of the early web, information was copied and recopied endlessly. John Perry Barlow's Declaration of the Independence of Cyberspace was one of the first such objects, spread via email and website until it became nearly impossible to ignore. More recently, Cory Doctorow's lecture on DRM for Microsoft Research, which is available online in text, or pig Latin, or video. It's been passed around like a cheap $2, well, you know. Each of these individual artifacts eventually reached nearly every single individual who might find them interesting, because as they were copied and read and forwarded and linked to, each of the human nodes in this network made a decision that this information was important enough to share. In the networked error, salience is the only significant quality of information. For that reason, it was only a matter of time until the technologies of the network would re reinforce this natural tendency and accelerate it. So even as the web died, it was reborn. The top-down design of a hundred centralized sources of information evolved into 700 million peers, from each according to their ability and to each according to their need. Feeds replaced websites, and torrents replaced streams. The revolution we had fleetingly glimpsed had finally, blessedly arrived. But one man's blessing is another's curse. The network revolution presented incredible opportunities to anyone working in the media industries. Suddenly it became possible to reach massive audiences, unbounded by proximity. But instead of reinforcing the previous structures of media ownership, and information distribution, the network has consistently undermined them. Mention Craigslist to a newspaper man and watch as the color drains from their face. Casually drop BitTorrent into a conversation with a studio executive and observe as they choke back their rage. The network carries within it the seeds of their own destruction and they're absolutely, utterly, completely powerless to stop it. Now that would be a sad story 
if the professional media had not willingly cooperated in their own demise. The technologies of the digital era were simply too tempting to be ignored, too important to the bottom line. But the network has its own economics, and it quickly overcomes or blithely ignores any attempt to subvert its innate qualities. Film studios make the majority of their revenue from DVD distribution of their productions, but that same DVD, because of its essentially digital nature, can be copied and recopied endlessly at no cost. If it is salient, it will be copied widely. That's not just a horror story, that's the law. And if you don't want your film copied, well then, you'd have to resort to antique production technique. Make sure it's shot to film stock, physically edited, and good luck finding an editor who's happier on a steam beck than an avid, and graded with no digital intermediates, then projected into an exhibition space where every audience member has been subjected to a humiliating physical search of their bodies. Well, you'd probably kill piracy if you did that, but you'd kill your exhibition revenues, and the studios, and the record companies, and the broadcasters, and the book publishers, they want to have it both ways. They want the benefits of digital distribution, all the while denying the essential quality of the medium, that it exists to be copied. But all of this noise about the approaching end of copyright obscures a more salient point. The barriers to distribution have utterly collapsed. Anyone can send anything to everyone, anywhere, at no cost. The tribulations of the professional media producers are simply the canary in the coal mine. They're the most sensitive to the economics of a distribution which has kept them well fed for a hundred years. Now those economics have irrevocably changed and the entire business of professional media production is threatened. <laughs>